everyone. Uh, I call the Senate Housing and Homelessness Prevention Committee to order. We do have a quorum. Uh, today we are hearing bills around zoning and land use, all of which will be laid over and considered for the package that we'll be taking up next Tuesday. Language for that bill will be posted as soon as it's ready as a delete all amendment. Uh, we have a full day today with lots of testifiers and lots of people interested in this. I think this is the fullest our housing committee room has ever been, so welcome. <laughs> Um, so we will be, because we have uh, well over 25 testifiers today, uh, we will be enforcing a strict two minute um, per testifier and Davin will have a timer up that will beep when your time is up. So please stick to that, it will be enforced. I'm also gonna call up the next testifier um, to sort of get people prepped up at the table so we can move seamlessly through that and have still time for discussion on the bills. Uh, so with that, we will move to our first bill on the agenda, Senate File 4601, Senator Bolden. Senator Bolden, thank you for bringing this bill to our committee. Uh, I believe you do have an A1 amendment. Yes, Madam Chair, that is correct. Uh, Senator Bolden moves the A1 author's amendment. Any questions? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The amendment is adopted. Senator Bolden, to your bill as amended. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. I am pleased to be before you today with Senate File 4601. Uh, this is a bill, um, around emergency shelter and making sure that uh, folks who need that in our communities have access to that. Uh, this bill um, has, I've worked on this bill in, in collaboration with the Minnesota Collab uh, Coalition for the Homeless. Uh, and I just wanna share some, um, some of the reality uh, with you around homelessness in our communities. Um, 8,393 individuals were experiencing homelessness on a given night in uh, Minnesota as of January of 2023. Uh, that number has not gotten better since that time. And about 20% of those uh, were unsheltered. And that includes moms, dads, kids, our community members. Family homelessness increased 27% in Minnesota between 2022 and 2023, and 45% of individuals experiencing homelessness in 2023 came from individuals with children, came from households uh, with children. Uh, members, as we have had many conversations in this committee, uh, you know, we have a housing crisis in our state, and we have uh, many community members experiencing homelessness and uh, we need to be sure that they have the resources that they need and so um, emergency shelters is one way to do that. And so this is a fairly uh, straightforward bill um, which just says that emergency shelter facilities and um, that uh, term is defined in the amendment and we uh, used a definition in statute that was from the um, HHS omnibus bill last year, the emergency shelter grants, it's that same definition. Um, that uh, municipalities um, uh, cannot, uh, essentially cannot use zoning um, as, a, as a rationale to not have these facilities in their community. And so um, they, can be, uh, uh, they can be present um, in any areas that are not zoned as residential or agricultural. And so um, again, trying to meet the needs uh, that are vast in our communities to be sure that uh, we can have these shelters where they can be placed to meet the needs in our community. And so um, I would draw members' attention to the many letters of support in your packets. It is clear uh, that this is would be a, a positive step um, by the people doing this work. Um, and so I would call attention to those letters of support. And we do have a couple of testifiers as well, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Bolden. Uh, first on the list for testifiers, I have Molly Jolma. Okay, we'll go to our second testifier, uh, Dan Fifield. I believe Dan's joining us virtually. Yes, good afternoon. Thank you, Madam Chair and other members of uh, the committee for inviting me in today. Uh, my name is Dan Fifield. I am the co-founder of the Landing Inn in Rochester, Minnesota. We are a day center that operates seven days a week, 365 days a year, working with individuals that are experiencing homelessness. 
In 2021, we were looking to purchase a tract of land in the northern part of Rochester, Minnesota, that was uh, per zoning regulations zoned appropriately uh, for our use. Uh, we investigated this extensively and then were told two weeks before closing that it did not meet zoning requirements. We were assured on three different occasions by city planning that it was, um, but then they came back around to political winds had changed at the time and we were told that it did not qualify for that zoning. Um, we were able to secure a piece of property in the downtown area of Rochester, Minnesota that was um, a tenth the size of the property that we were looking at and about half the square footage, which makes it very difficult for us to do um, and provide the services that we were wanting to provide at the time. But we're currently working with our county partners and other nonprofits in town to uh, try and determine what's the best approach for our area to um, address our, our issues with, with homelessness. Um, and the one thing that we're, we keep running up against is the lack of property that's available that would meet zoning regulations. So this bill, uh, this is very, very important that we get this um, enacted so that that shelters and nonprofits that are wanting to do the heavy lifting in this work uh, are able to obtain property that may not be perfectly zoned uh, under the rule of the law to fit their needs, but can be utilized. Your consideration in this is greatly appreciated by myself and I know everybody that's involved um, in this huge effort to try and um, make homelessness uh, non-reoccurring a one-time event. But thank you for your time today. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Fifield. Uh, members, questions or discussion? Senator Dreheim. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, Senator Bolden, for bringing this forward. Um, the, uh, the amendment talks about um, township, and what, what is the purpose of that in, in the bill? Is that a technical fix? Senator Bolden. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator uh, Draham, for the question. Uh, yes, so the bill applies to municipalities. It spells out um, towns, and, and it just is a technicality. A town does include a township, but we just wanted to be explicit, so it is, it's technical. Senator Draham. So I was going to go to nonpartisan chair, if I could, to get some clarification if that would mess up any other statutes by adding that if it isn't already in statute? Ms. Painter. Madam Chair and Senator Draham, this might be a better question for local government council, but my understanding is that the terms town and township are used interchangeably, so it doesn't necessarily, it's not required to add it in this bill. I don't think it negatively impacts anything else in that chapter, but I would prefer to confirm that with Joan White. Senator Draheim. Thank you. And, and this is being laid over, correct? That's correct. All and eventually they will, anything that makes it through will go to state gov. Perfect. I appreciate it. No more. Thanks. Members, any other questions or discussion? Senator Bolden, thank you very much. Your bill is laid over for possible inclusion. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. The next bill up is Senate File 3980. Senator Pa. Welcome to the testifier table, Senator Pa. Uh, do you have an author's amendment today? I do. Thank you, Chair Port and members. Um, I have a uh, author's amendment A2 to move. Senator Pa moves the A2 author's amendment. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The amendment is adopted. Senator Pa to your bill as amended. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Port and members. Thank you for the opportunity to present my bill, which is SF3980, which allows for the by right development of multifamily housing in commercial districts. This would increase supply, provide greater housing options, and result in more livable and desirable cities through mixed use development. Many of today's restrictive growth policies are rooted in racist policies, established, enacted, and enforced to exclude BIPOC communities and residents. Today, these policies continue to perpetuate segregated communities and limit economic and social opportunities and access. 
those who suffer the consequences of these exclusionary and restrictive growth policies are our most vulnerable neighbors, our lowest income neighbors, and even workers in our most in-demand jobs. Administrative review processes have been implemented successfully in other states and can be done while ensuring local governments and city staff still have the adequate time to review proposals for compliance. The bill is largely a byproduct of the recommendations of the Minnesota Housing Partnership and Habitat for Humanity of Minnesota's Affordable Housing Supply Work Group. The recommendations to allow multifamily buy right in commercial districts and density bonuses for affordable housing units was identified as the biggest game changer for affordable housing in Minnesota. Uh, Chair Port, I do have some testifiers that would like to speak to this bill, and then afterwards, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Senator Pa. First on the list, I have Ann Mavity, and following Ann, I have Sarah Larson. Welcome to the committee, Ms. Mavity. Please introduce yourself for the record and present your testimony. Thank you so much for the opportunity. My name is Ann Mavity. I'm the executive director of the Minnesota Housing Partnership. I appreciate coming back to the committee. Uh, I am here today both as someone who has fought for uh, creating more housing and more affordable housing across Minnesota for decades now, but also as a three-term former city council member in St. Louis Park. Someone I also served on the Metro Cities Board, chaired the Metro Cities Board, and served on the League of Minnesota Cities Board. So I have an understanding from several perspectives about how important this legislation is. So Minnesota, as you know, needs more than 100,000 homes. And our challenge right now is that the current processes, the current regulatory environment for zoning and land use is not allowing us to create and address that gap. So we are looking for ways to help facilitate that and make it more efficient and more affordable, reducing costs as well as time. New data has shown that will come out this week that it's particularly acute for our lowest income households, where out of every 34, out of every 34, um, excuse me, out of every 100 low income households, there's only 34 homes that are available and affordable to them. So that gap is huge. So right now our system, yeah, and the whole policy environment is a little bit stuck. So the state back in 2018 set in motion uh, the state housing task force that said we need 300,000 new homes by 2030. The regional government has housing goals, affordability goals for the region. Greater MSP is looking at how do we support job growth. There's housing goals in all of those. Cities and counties across the state have housing goals. What's happening is that project by project, 30 units at a time, those housing goals are being thwarted because one neighbor says, but details, details. Not here, not now. So we have whole policy agenda that's being thwarted and this legislation would help facilitate and ensure that we can accomplish the goals that this committee and others have laid out. Thank you very much, Ms. Mavity. Uh, Ms. Larson, please introduce yourself for the record and present your testimony. And after Ms. Larson, I have Ben Helvick Anderson. Thank you. My name is Sarah Larson, principal at Landing Group. Landing Group is a consultant that works exclusively with affordable housing providers. Since 2012, we have been or are involved in the development or rehab of nearly 7,000 units throughout the state. In my experience, every affordable development has a story. Here's one. In 2021, a developer proposed a market rate housing development, nearly 200 units, five stories in a western suburb. Per the staff report, it complied with the upper limit of the density called for in the comprehensive plan. At the sketch plan review at Consul, one of the re multiple required steps, Consul members said things like, I love this, I'm so excited by it, infinitely better use of the land, a very promising development. In 2022, with the well-documented market conditions that made the pursuit of high-end housing challenging, the developer opted to make the project 100% affordable with units for homeless households and people with disabilities. They went back to sketch plan in 2022 June and promised two phases, the same height and less density than the market rate building, again, complying with the comprehensive plan. The city council said things like, why so tall? Why not townhomes? This feels really large, but we do need affordable housing. Residents attended the meeting in support and opposition. 
By 23, December 23, we obtained federal tax credits and state resources, a portion of which this body allocated last year to construct the building. In February, the developer went back to Consul just last month for a sketch plan review to begin the PUD process. They, the developer, in response to the Consul and residents' feedback, had changed the design completely. The density was less than half of the original design. The height was reduced to three stories. There was more green space, less setbacks, larger setbacks. The city council chambers were standing room only. Neighbors in opposition have been crowdsourcing funding to support opposition efforts. The result, not a single council member said they were willing to support the development moving forward at this time. They cited the need to do a small area plan and change the comprehensive plan if necessary, 12 to 18 month process. The developer returned the funding last month. It's not a unique story. This legislation is needed. Thank you very much, Ms. Larson. Uh, Mr. Helvick Anderson, uh, please introduce yourself for the record and present your testimony. And after Mr. An uh, Helvick Anderson, I have Daniel Lightfoot. Thank you, Chair Port and members of the committee. My name is Ben Helvick Anderson, and I'm the Vice President of Policy and Organizing at Beacon Interfaith Housing Collaborative. I'm here to speak in support of SF 3980. Beacon is a collaborative of over 100 congregations that creates new, deeply affordable homes across the metro. We believe our current zoning system and land use system is broken. All of the communities we develop in desperately need the housing we are trying to build and have goals and comprehensive plans that compel them to approve it. Yet the process is always a fight. Of the 20 multifamily buildings that we have created over the last 20 years, all of them have had to face some type of opposition during the land use approval. Our development model, which involves organizing local people of faith to advocate for each development, is in response to this. We work to pack each land use hearing with supporters because we know that a few loud residents can show up and block the whole thing. Because of our model, we win these fights, but usually by a single vote. No developer should have to spend the resources we do to get a project approved. Developers need predictability and consistency in the approval process. By allowing an administrative review process based on a city's comprehensive plan, you remove the politics of NIMBY, not in my backyard, out of the approval process. Lastly, our current process perpetuates our racist zoning system. Local planning commissions who are supposed to decide if, our, if a development fits local zoning and, regu and local regulations usually end up refereeing a public debate on who does and doesn't belong in a city. I have seen this myself in so many of the land use hearings and heard the ugliest things. This bill proposes a process that trusts in the thorough work done by city leaders who created their comprehensive plans and goals over the strong opinions of a few often white homeowners to protect perpetuate the status quo. Please support this bill. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Helvick Anderson. Uh, Mr. Lightfoot, welcome to the table. After Mr. Lightfoot will be Bradley Peterson. Uh, Mr. Lightfoot, please introduce yourself for the record and present your testimony. Well, good afternoon, uh, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Daniel Lightfoot. I'm with the League of Minnesota Cities. Uh, the League represents the collective interests of 838 member cities across the state of Minnesota. Uh, we do appreciate uh, the conversations that we've had with uh, members of this committee um, and the author, uh, but we respectfully uh, oppose Senate File 3980 at this time. Uh, we did submit a, a letter that is uh, co-signed by uh, all of the other city organizations uh, for this bill. Uh, and the other bill that we're going to hear um, uh, stating our concerns. Multifamily residential development is uh, obviously an incredibly important part of the housing continuum for communities and their residents. Uh, cities have and continue to consistently pull levers at the local level to provide significant resources to attract affordable and multifamily development. We appreciate the attention of this important housing stock. However, ensuring that the new development opportunities both infill and greenfield have adequate infrastructure and comply with the the city's overall density goals and state and as well as state and federal regulations take significant planning. Unfortunately, Senate File 3980 replaces a city's ability to plan with another rigid framework that shoehorns dense buildings into areas that can't support it. We continue to have concerns with the approach. Uh, the bill requires multifamily dwellings to be constructed by right in any district, not zoned residential, uh, single family residential or ag, um, as tall as the tallest structure within a quarter mile radius of the parcel up to 150 feet in height. 
The bill lacks a definition of structure, uh, still meaning every city with a water tower, grain silo, macro cell wireless facility uh, up to 150 feet uh, could have a 150 foot residential building uh, on lots uh, outside of industrial ag or, uh, or single family. The language also has the effect of substantially limiting or all but eliminating setback requirements for multifamily development. This means there could be a case that a building close to the height of the Lumber Exchange building in St. Paul, which is 165 feet, could be built next door to uh, potentially other uh, lower density multi, uh, multifamily single family homes with no spacing or setbacks. Buildings of that size, uh, of course, and that density carry a magnitude of uh, water, sewer, emergency response, storm water, and neighborhood impacts. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Happy to stand for questions. Thank you, Mr. Lightfoot. Uh, Bradley Peterson, and on deck is Jim Kuman. Welcome to the committee, Mr. Peterson. Please introduce yourself for the record and present your testimony. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members. My name is Bradley Peterson with Flaherty and Hood here today on behalf of the Coalition of Greater Minnesota Cities. And uh, like uh, our colleagues at the League of Minnesota Cities, CGMC shares the goals of this and other bills to build more housing, uh, yet we have deep concerns with the approach uh, taken in this bill. I think for starters, all of the city officials that we talk to in greater Minnesota are doing everything in their power to accommodate new housing in their communities. They are doing so in thoughtful and creative ways. In fact, when it comes to multifamily housing, the subject of this bill, multifamily housing permits have been steadily increasing as a share of all residential permits issued. In 2010, multifamily housing consisted of about 30% of residential permits. In 2023, uh, multifamily consisted of approximately 50% of all permits issued. So simply stated, the trend is going in a positive direction without the overreaching interventions contemplated in this bill. Uh, the solutions proposed in this bill uh, simply don't resonate with um, our members' understanding of the housing challenges in their communities. Uh, both this bill and uh, Senate File 36 or 3964 substitute the legislature's judgment for that of local elected officials, utility operators, and professional planning staff. Uh, with respect to this bill and its requirement uh, that it would allow uh, multifamily in uh, most zoning areas, uh, including commercial by right, regardless of the sufficiency of important infrastructure, including water, wastewater, electric, stormwater, et cetera. This is our biggest concern with this piece of legislation, and it does not seem to allow for the right sizing of infrastructure to suit changing uses within a given part of the city. Um, we have other concerns with this bill, um, many of which I think were pretty well um, stated by Mr. Lightfoot, so I won't repeat them. Uh, but we do look forward to continuing this conversation uh, with you and the bill author. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Peterson. You. Uh, Mr. Kuman, welcome to the testimony. Please introduce yourself for the record. After Mr. Kuman's testimony, we'll be going to Gabe Kravitz, who is joining us online. Uh, Mr. Kuman, please introduce yourself for the record and present your testimony. Good afternoon, I'm Jim Kuman. I'm a small business owner and multifamily property owner, small multifamily property owner, uh, under 12 units, and also a zoning consultant and consultant to cities and nonprofits working on housing development. So I both own property as well as consult to help people get more housing, especially middle scale housing. I wanna start by, uh, I, my to the testimony today is actually for both 3964 and 3980. They're the same issues. In my, from my opinion, I will cede my time if it comes up again in the other, other bill. Um, first of all, this is a win for property rights. As an individual property owner, to be able to put something on my property, to extend uh, my property, to help my family, friends, other people, to be able to house them in my community, in my neighborhood, this is something that helps my household and it helps uh, the people around me in my community. And it helps multi-generational housing, which is a huge growing need, being able to put people in proximity with each other because of that support for childcare, for helping elderly. Um, this helps make that smallest scale easier. And uh, by having a state law that levels the playing field, we're not playing this game about, well, in one city we have like this, we have one city like that. It allows me a greater range of properties that I can uh, be a part of um, to have that happen. So property rights is a huge part of this bill. Second, it builds wealth for families and households, both at the individual level, uh, by being able to have some side income for, for a family. And it's a huge boost to me as an independent uh, small business owner. I don't have uh, a 401k or things like that. So being able to have an extra income source through these types of uh, properties is helpful. This also builds wealth for city tax bases. By taking an individual small scale lot, you're able to put one or two more units on it. You're growing the value of that lot. And it actually grows 
quite significantly because you're using the same amount of infrastructure on a same a normal lot. And so this actually can greatly increase the amount of property tax value in a city and grow that tax base for services um, and help to pay for infrastructure costs without adding significant amounts uh, of, of new in some cases, especially for small development. I support this testimony and I look forward to being able to uh, make adjustments to it. Certain mechanisms do need to be fixed uh, before approval. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, Mr. Kravitz, welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record and present your testimony. Uh, thank you, Chair Port and members of the committee for the opportunity to testify. Uh, I'm Gabe Kravitz from the Pew Charitable Trust's Housing Policy Initiative. Uh, Pew's researched jurisdictions that have already implemented so, uh, some of the bill's provisions uh, and uh, uh, in SF 3980, including permitting multifamily housing development, simplifying permitting, and reducing parking requirements. The results have been increased housing production, reduced homelessness, and improved affordability. There's now enough data from places adopting some of the bill's provisions to know rent growth has slowed, displacement has been reduced, and the environmental impact of sprawl has decreased. For example, more flexible zoning, especially allowing multifamily homes on commercial corridors, has helped keep rents flat in Minneapolis uh, since the start of 2017, even as rents rose 20% in Minnesota overall and 29% nationwide. Thanks to increased housing production, Minneapolis renters are paying an estimated $1,700 less per year than if rents had increased at the same rate as in Minnesota overall. This has made it more likely that families of modest means can remain in their communities. When there's enough housing for residents in cities and towns, it also prevents sprawl and reduces miles driven. Allowing apartments and other lower cost forms of housing has not just improved rental affordability, but also helped reduce homelessness. For example, when Minneapolis permitted 21,000 new units from 2017 to 2022, Hennepin County's homeless, uh, homelessness drops 12% during that same time, but rose 14% in the rest of Minnesota. In light of these successful outcomes, states like Montana, California, and Florida have passed similar laws on a bipartisan basis, making it easier for, uh, to build multifamily homes that are affordable to first-time home buyers and middle-class families. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Kravitz. Uh, members, now we'll move to discussion, uh, questions, and amendments. Senator Lucero. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator Pa, and, and to the testifiers. I, I always appreciate uh, when it comes to housing, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, throwing ideas on the table. And this is certainly an idea uh, that is worth, worth a conversation, but I do have concerns. So <coughs> I guess the first might be even for, for uh, staff, uh, in the amendment that was adopted, on line 1.15, it speaks about a seven-day period for uh, application review. And I guess my first question that I'm, I'm thinking of is, how does that seven-day threshold compare to other development application timeframes that might exist uh, in statute right now? Ms. Painter. And if it takes some time, Madam Chair, to look it up, I could ask, go to number two to... Senator Pat, do you want to respond? Yeah, I can. Uh, Madam Chair, Senator Lucero, thank you for that question. Um, right now, there isn't anything that spe specifies how many days, but I do understand, I think your point might be that that could be very limiting, the seven days. Um, and so that's something that I'd be more than happy to discuss and cons reconsider to see what would be appropriate. As someone who served on the City Council of Brooklyn Park for seven year, or six years, um, I understand on the local level uh, when we are processing these applications what it takes. Uh, and so thank you for bringing up that, that point and that question. Senator Lucero. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I appreciate that, Senator Pobb. Uh, and there's a myriad of reasons why. It could be a complex application with many different addendums and parts to it that need to be reviewed. Or it could be uh, one of the cities in my area recently had uh, in their planning department, I think it was a staff turnover all at the same time. I think three people left. And it can just, they may not work to be able to get it done in seven days. So yeah, no, I appreciate your, your willingness to, to recognize that. The next point uh, that I would uh, just bring forward, and, and it doesn't have to, have to be a question, but just uh, a, a challenge for areas like mine. So 
I drive through Brooklyn Park uh, multiple times per day, so I, I know the area, and I grew up in New Brighton and know the area of Fridley, Spring Lake Park, Columbia Heights. Uh, most of those cities are, are fully built out or nearly built out. And the infrastructure's in place, decisions have been made, business parks, residential areas, et cetera. But out where I am now in the area that I represent, they are actively building out. Mm -hmm. And one of the, the big challenges uh, that, that is in my area is we are a low commercial industrial area. And that has significant challenges on school funding in my area. So one of the things that my community has been doing the entire, times I've been, entire time I've been in the legislature, 10 years, is actively trying to build out their commercial industrial because the tax rate of, of CI properties is more than residential. And that helps the, the school funding challenge that we face. And it's because of the, the current dynamics, largely a bedroom community, that referendums continue to fail because the tax burden goes on the, the residential properties rather than onto the CI uh, properties. So what, could, what would happen here in this particular scenario is there could be business parks that have been zoned or guided, I should say, guided for commercial industrial, which are generally taxed at 1.5 or 2, a rate of 1.5 or 2, so they have a higher tax rate. But then those areas that the city is trying to actively build out as commercial industrial, then a multi-unit comes in and it's probably going to be taxed at 1.25, uh, significantly less than what a CI property would be. And so it's just going to create a further funding challenge for, again, my community that's trying to be built out versus those other communities that are first ring, second ring suburbs that are already built out. Uh, the next thing I would do, so I'm just throwing that out there just to chew on and, and just, it's a challenge uh, for, for communities such as mine. Uh, the next I would throw out there, it's, it's a very legitimate concern that the, some of the testifiers have, have uh, brought up is the infrastructure. So when I was in, so the first community, the first house my wife and I bought was the city of Dayton. Dayton, everybody was on well and septics, I think for just a small sliver of the city, very small sliver, but it's a well and septic community. Then the city came in and they, they passed uh, city sewer water. So they had to, to, to retrofit all that to, the, to different areas of the city. They didn't pass it all at once, but different areas of the city. And in doing, then, doing that, they're, they're calculating, based on guided zoning, the amount of capacity, which could be the diameter of, of the sewer pipe, the number of lift stations required for that infrastructure that they're putting in, the number of water towers that are needed, where to put the water towers, the number of pumping, the well stations. And so we all know that commercial industrial property has significantly less, depending on the type of business, but significantly less water consumption and then sewer uh, usage. And when, if there, I can envision when this, the sewer water infrastructure was planned and may have been put into the ground, with the intention of a business park, if under this legislation, now you can come in and build a 50 unit apartment complex, one to three units or a 100 unit apartment complex, the infrastructure that may be in the ground cannot support the capacity. And it could throw off, again, all those dynamics, water towers, lift stations, the diameter, because it depends on where it is. You know, the sewer, as you start at the source, it's a wider diameter and you get a, a narrower diameter as you get further down the pipe. And then, not an engineer, so I don't know all the, all the, all the ins and outs of it. But then I'll, I'll just throw one more point out there, and that is there's an area in one of the cities near me where they are near capacity for water. They don't have a water tower, so it's just a well. Uh, and, and I think right now, if I remember correctly, my numbers might be slightly off, but I, it let, let's say it's roughly this, a water capacity under the current infrastructure for about 100 more residential units. If you come in with a 100-unit apartment complex, that could fill up the capacity for that area, and then it stops everything else in that area, everything, because there's no more capacity, unless they then have to make that jump to $3.5 million dollar uh, or what is a water tower now? One and a half million, two million dollars for water tower, right? They just may not be able to, to do that. So there are some significant challenges I can see that will come with this if this isn't, is indeed going to go across the entire state uh, because the areas that are currently being built out 
are vastly different and have different considerations in those areas that are already or nearly built out. So I appreciate uh, the opportunity just to throw those out there because again, I, I appreciate the conversation, but yeah, we need to work on some more of the details. So thank you. Senator Mohammed. Thank you, Chair. Um, I have a few questions. Um, and the so I'm looking at subdivision eight administrative review process um, under C. The administrative review shall not involve public hearing unless one is required by state or federal law. What, uh, I guess my question is, why are we sort of taking out the local control of allowing a city to be able to have a public hearing if they want to in this case? Senator Path. Thank you, Chair Port and uh, Senator Muhammad. Um, so what this talks about is that there is an administrative review process that uh, what we're asking is that cities establish that administrative review process. Um, and what will happen is that they don't have something that, like that in place, or even they do, but then they also uh, have to have city council um, go through a process in which they review it and they have a public hearing. Oftentimes what will happen is that uh, to the testifiers who spoke before, is that things, things that they had uh, talked with the developers ahead of time that said, this is what we want to see in a project, this is what we want to see the development here. In a public hearing, sometimes that tends to kind of change. All of a sudden, they change what they uh, originally said, okay, this would be uh, a good idea here, and then all of a sudden, it's something else. But I agree that it not necessarily means that public hearings are a bad thing, I'm not saying that it is because, um, like I said before, I used to serve on the city council in Brooklyn Park. We have many public hearings. And through those public hearings, sometimes we will hear things that maybe we haven't considered uh, as a council or as a city. Um, I'm more than, uh, I'm open to the idea of um, talking this through to see what is the best uh, path forward not stuck to this, but at the same time, not saying that we would be willing to throw this out, but what would be a best option? Uh, but public hearings, as uh, sometimes as to one of the testifiers uh, spoke about, is that it brings out that one or two or few residents who sometimes are the loudest voice, but not necessarily the majority of the voices in that community. Senator Mohammed. Um, Madam Chair, Senator, Pa, thank you so much. I appreciate that, and I um, understand your perspective and what, where that's coming from. I, th I think you're right. We often do hear from some of the loudest voices, but I think that when a community, um, there's a development happening in their community, we should always give them the right to be able to come and speak, whether they're the loudest voices or not. I think as public officials, it is our duty to hear from those constituents, just like we're hearing from today, so that's really important to me. The other question I have is, um, under D, it says the application subject to the administrative review process under this su a subdivision must be approved or denied within 60 days. Yeah. As a former staffer at City Hall, it takes a long time to review these, pro especially when you're from a large city. Like, I'm curious as to where the number 60 days came from. And on top of that, it says if the city fails to approve or deny, meaning they haven't even gone through the approval process, then the application shall be deemed approved. Mm -hmm. And I think there's many questions that can come from that, especially if something, if the community doesn't agree with something and now we're saying no public hearing, you have 60 days to approve or not. If not, it's approved. Who, who like, where, who does then takes the fault when something happens wrong? Mm -hmm. Is it the city, is it, is it the developer? And you know, I'll also say this, I understand where this bill is coming from because I think our zoning laws have often been restrictive and have had a lot of racism behind them. We know that. So I guess those are some of the questions that I would like the answers to. Yeah, Madam Chair, um, Senator Mohammed, thank you for the question. So 60 days is the number that we put out there, but I would say that coming from Brooklyn Park again, Brooklyn Park actually has the 60 days in place as our own policy without this requirement here, we currently do. Um, and we also have in our own policy, when I was on the city council, and I believe it still exists, 
and it has not been changed, is that this exact language, which is that it's 60 days. And if we do not uh, state otherwise that it's denied, then past that 60 days, it is deemed approved. So a lot of cities, I shouldn't say a lot, but some cities already have this in place, some do not. There are some cities who don't have anything in place, and that's the other thing is that this would require cities to establish some administrative review process that's very transparent. Um, now, uh, 60 days to me, I feel like it's, it's plenty of time for them to do the due diligence that they need to do and to talk with developers regarding a project. And so if after the 60 days and they do not have a written approval or denial to the applicant, then it's deemed approved. And that, that if, if that falls through the crack for, to your question, who, who kind of takes responsibility? The city, because it's the city's job within 60 days to either approve or deny it or have those conversations. If they haven't said anything, whether it's denied or approved, then it's deemed approved. Um, so that's where that one stands. Thank you, Senator. Okay, yes. Ms. Mavity. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, Senator Muhammad, thank you. I if I can add as well, the 60 day is currently a nonpartisan staff, uh, research staff could probably confirm this, 60 day is currently the framework in which that is required already today. Mm -hmm. What this is trying to do is ensure that uh, the project continues to move uh, efficiently through that process and is not faced with delays in being reviewed. If I may also just note in your earlier question about uh, public participation and community input, as many of us who are former elected officials understand how critical and important that is and want to make sure that that input is, is included in the zoning and comprehensive plan guiding that the city has done. What we're trying to do is ensure that development by development by development that the city staff who are professionals and reviewing an application for its compliance with what the city has laid out as its rules, that the city staff as a professional can lend that expertise and, and have a checklist to say yes or no, but not allow those individual voices coming in to thwart what the city is trying to accomplish that it established in its public process previous in establishing what that comp plan and zoning was. Senator Mohammed, um, Ms. Thank you, Chair. So, Ms. Mavity, you're saying that the zoning will go through public hearing, but not development to development. Correct? That is Ms. the Mavity. intent. Madam Chair, Senator Mohammed, that is the intention of this legislation. That is correct. Senator um, Mohammed, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I think every city is different and every city's needs are different. I think Minneapolis is different than Brooklyn Park, Brooklyn Center, different than um, Rochester. And I think that every city's council swings and moves a different way, at least Minneapolis, that's the case. And the interest is different depending on who holds those seats. And I think it is always important that we hear from the community and they are the most um, important voices in shaping our city and our development. I think we should eliminate the restrictions with our zoning laws I'm not sure how I feel about the idea of taking away community voice when it comes to development, to development, especially coming from a minority community who only come um, when something is, is like the thing that the community hears most from. And so I agree in essence with the law and I don't know how I feel about 60 days in given cities. Because I think 60 days, I could reason with it if, if then, you know, then you're saying the application is deemed approved, like if the city doesn't get to it and the fault is on the city, that's our tax dollars come from our community and ultimately the fault then comes back to us. And so I take an issue with that. I think we should, I'd love to continue working through this as it moves through committees, if you're open to that. Absolutely. Senator Pat. Uh, Senator Mohammed. Thank you, and I, I appreciate your comments, and I agree with you that we don't ever want to limit our public's um, uh, opportunity to give input. Um, and uh, to um, uh, Ms. Mavity's point, uh, they do have that process when we go through zoning, comprehensive plan, planning. It's really what I've seen, at, even at the local level, and here is that 
what will happen is projects will come in and when it's an affordable project, affordable unit project, people will come out and say, not in my backyard. But then if it's a market rate, high, high scale um, apartments, all of a sudden it's okay. Um, and so what we want to do is make sure that when we are establishing some of these zoning land use um, and some of these comprehensive plans ahead of time, that it already fits everybody's vision and the inputs there. But then when it comes to the project to project, that is, we're not deciding based on what kind of project and whether or not we want that in our backyard versus a set uh, process or a set um, uh, requirements that people already are meeting or developers are meeting in that project so but I appreciate you I, I understand where you're coming from and I look forward to continuing to work with you to improve this bill madam chair may Senator I add Muhammad. to that the reason why I I think sort of was very stuck on the idea of public hearing from for, for, for our communities when it comes to development to development is because our communities don't understand what zoning laws are but they understand when an apartment is being built next to their home or whether that's affordable or not, they'll come and speak because they know what that is. They don't know what zoning laws are. And so that's why that is really important to me. And you're right. I think that affordable housing is the thing that we need the most and we should continue to build it. There should be standard on that. Mm -hmm. And our community voice is also the most important thing in that process. Thank you. Senator Dreheim. Thank you, Chair. Um, Thank you for bringing this bill forward and, and working on uh, important housing issue. I, I had a couple comments about some definitions, but I know we're short on time. I, I talked to our fantastic staff that I think we need to put some uh, definitions around them if this bill is moving forward and uh, just look forward to future uh, discussions on this topic as we come to next week. Thanks. Thank you, Senator Dreheim and Senator Pa. Happy to work with both of you as uh, this moves forward. Senator Bolden. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just a comment briefly. Thank you, Senator Pa, for bringing this bill. Um, we have had many conversations in this committee about the extreme uh, uh, housing supply deficit we have across the state. And so um, I appreciate you bringing a solution to, to that. Not that it will solve all of that, but it's a piece of the puzzle, right? Like we need to be doing many things. This is one avenue to get to that point, building more and allowing more, removing the barriers for more multifamily housing in our communities will absolutely uh, help with that uh, huge supply deficit we have. It will make more um, you know, livable communities. It will provide options for people that we desperately need. So thank you uh, for bringing this bill. Madam Chair, uh, Senator, Senator Bolden, thank you. Uh, members, any other questions? Okay. Uh, Senator Pa, thank you very much for bringing this bill. Uh, it is laid over for possible inclusion. And we will move to our last bill on the agenda today, Senate File 3964, Senator Mitchell. Report. Senator Dreheim. If, if we have a minute while we're mm -hmm. waiting for the chief author, could you maybe explain uh, what your plans are next week? Yes, that's a great question, Senator Dreheim. Um, members, as we've been having these conversations through the last few weeks and now hearing these bills over the last few days, it is my intention over today and tomorrow uh, with many conversations with this committee to um, pull some version of a land use and zoning reform package together to be heard in the committee on Tuesday. Um, we will hear the whole bill again on Tuesday, which whatever pieces we pull from uh, the bills that have been heard on Tuesday of this week and today. Um, we will post that as soon as possible. I'm hoping to have language finalized tomorrow afternoon so that folks will have the weekend to look over it um, or at least uh, have an idea of what's in it before the committee. Um, and then once we move that bill, hear that bill on Tuesday, it will be sent to state and local government um, where after that it will move through their process. Senator Dreheim. And then uh, Chair, what is the plan for Thursday then? Or do you think it'll take two days to go through your bill? 
I don't think it will take two days, Senator Draheim. Uh, I think there's a very good chance that we will not have committee on Thursday because I will hopefully be presenting that bill in state and local gov during that time. Uh, that's the hope, assuming that we can, can be ready to go. Uh, we are gonna recess for just a few minutes. We'll be back at the call of the chair. That was a super. Uh, from where you were chairing your, uh, where you I were chairing to be state fast. and local. Yes. Um, Senator Mitchell, welcome to the committee. Take your time getting settled there. Uh, when you're ready, you can go ahead with uh, Senate file 3964 uh, whenever you're ready. Uh, Thank you so much, Chair and members of the committee, and uh, thank you for your patience as I dashed over from my other committee. Um, I am honestly really excited about this bill. This bill came as a result of a lot of bipartisan work as we try to address Minnesota's housing shortage. Um, just this piece of it, we've been working on for months since last year, and there is some ways that restrictive zoning in some of our communities kind of impact our efforts to make sure that we have more accessible and affordable housing for Minnesotans. Uh, the bipartisan effort of this, I will be transparent, I came at this from the environmental background. As a meteorologist and someone concerned about climate, um, how can we enable people, if they desire, to build or live in a, a smaller footprint because residential housing is 20% of our carbon emissions. How can we enable them to live closer to transportation if they choose public transportation as their option? As I got more into this space, I found out that because in Minnesota we have tens of thousands, uh, if not some estimates bring us to as much as 100,000 units that we are short, that means even if people can afford the housing, we literally just don't have enough and people in our state will end up ho homeless. And so as someone who also works in the child protection background and um, with a, as a foster parent with abused and neglected children, then you learn that because of that aspect, there are families that are homeless and live in their cars, not because they don't have jobs, but beha because they really don't have the access to housing, and that means some of them are broken apart, and it puts a different burden on our system in a different way. We had an affordable housing unit in my community last year that raised the rent over 12% to the point that some of those seniors couldn't afford it, and there, there was nowhere for them to go because there just isn't the housing. So that's some of the background I brought to this, but then as I worked with the other parties, including some of the people here at this table, I got the builder's perspective and builders who might have a unique piece of land that they want a little more flexibility to do something with, or a family that's having um, mom or grandpa want to come into their home but have their own separate space. I literally had someone in my office this morning that had a child, an adult child with mental health issues, and they were talking about, and we were talking about mental health, we were talking about a totally different thing, but they talked about trying to find housing for that child that was also stable. And if they could even add something onto their property, then that child is close but still has some autonomy. So there's so many reasons that we want to give the people of Minnesota more flexibility, um, do things that are better for families, allow more people to have a stake in the system and own their own homes, build the environmental standards if they want, um, and, and just kind of claim a few of their rights as property owners. So that's where this bill comes from. Um, with that said, I would like to go over just uh, a few of the highlights of the bill. We have uh, in the initial section a lot of definitions of just the, some of the different types of housing that this would um, include, such as cottage housing or those units I mentioned that might be something someone adds on so that you know mom can come stay in their housing. 
Um, we have some changes for architectural designs because sometimes some of those making a, a, a builder use one, one element versus another might add a lot of cost to a project and might not keep it affordable so, for someone. And the biggest part of this bill is it just allows developers, if they see a market for it, or if they have a customer that wants it, to add in what would be for most cities, a duplex. If it is in the typical residential housing, and if it's closer to uh, public transportation within a half mile, a fourplex. And it's a little bit more if they do environmental standards or if they do affordable housing, um, some slight deviations if it's a city of the first class. But for most cities in Minnesota, this is what we are talking about. The ability to add in a duplex or a fourplex, depending on where that location is. Um, this is, as I said, just such a critical need and I completely respect the ability for cities to plan out how their cities are going to look, but we have gotten to a point where the state also needs to have a more comprehensive plan so that we can address all of this, and we have been working with all of those stakeholders for months, um, usually on a daily basis, including today again. So we will continue to work on those things to make this viable for all the partners to come to the table. But our goal at the end of the day is to make sure our Minnesotans can have the homes that they want and the access to the stability that their family needs. So thank you so much. Thank you very much, Senator Mitchell. Uh, uh, to the audience and testifiers, again, we have quite a lengthy list today, so please try to keep to the two minutes, and if you can come get yourself ready if you are on deck. Mr. Erickson, you are up first, and after that, I have Reverend David Lant. Mr. Erickson, welcome to the committee. Please uh, introduce yourself uh, for the record and present your testimony. Thank you, Chair Port, members of the committee. My name is Nick Erickson, Senior Director of Housing Policy for Housing First Minnesota. I'm, I'm honored to sit here today with Senator Mitchell to talk about Senate File 3964 because it's a bill that employs proven strategies to address our housing crisis. As I told you just the other day, our housing ecosystem is in peril and the status quo housing policies that have gotten us here can no longer be relied upon to solve this crisis. The bill before you today addresses these challenges by lifting barriers to housing affordability and access. It legalizes more housing options for a growing state, places people in charge of their housing decisions, and ends exclusionary zoning. As we just heard from Pew, housing reforms in Minneapolis uh, reduced homelessness, beat housing inflation, and had a dramatic increase in housing inventory. Under this bill, established communities will have infill development opportunities at lower price points. American Enterprise Institute's Housing Center estimates a 30% reduction in the median price of these missing middle housing units relative to the $550,000 median new home price in the Twin Cities today. For growing communities, this bill will create new housing options, flexibility, and predictability in the development process. New starter homes will return to our market. And across Minnesota, near job centers where we need housing most, we will see it being built. And for those few visionary cities who have stepped up to meet this moment, this bill ensures that they alone do not bear the weight of solving this challenge. I'm asking you to vote yes today because it's proven strategies that we're looking at. And the sc scope of this housing crisis has far exceeded far beyond what the status quo can handle. Thank you for your time today. Vote yes because it will help ensure that your children and grandchildren have a future here in Minnesota. Thank you, Mr. Erickson. Uh, on deck is Steve Gottwald. Welcome to the committee, Reverend Lant. Please introduce yourself for the record and present your testimony. Thank you, Senators. My name is David Lant, and I'm honored to testify in favor of this bill as senior pastor of the Mills Church and 21-year resident of Minnetonka. I'm here because the most pressing need in our congregation is and has been affordable housing options. In addition, I field heartbreaking rental assistant requests from people outside of my congregation weekly. This reality motivated us to build affordable home ownership townhomes on two acres of our church property in partnership with Habitat for Humanity. However, countless hours in neighborhood engagement meetings, planning commission, and city council meetings have only produced an organized prevention campaign 
against changing single family zoning, created unnecessary cost increases, and has yet to result in an approved project. Our experience now entering its fifth year is regrettably predictable. It's not anomalous, but the norm. And this is in a city making housing diversity and affordability a goal, and with Minnetonka residents surveying two to one in favor of building the missing middle housing that this bill enables. We favor this bill because it safeguards land use decisions from being consistently thwarted by a minority of voices. And rather than fixate and die over density, it will shift our public engagement process to more constructive inputs. Single family zoning is a pre-existing condition stacked against middle housing proposals. Hence, cities rarely see them. In the past 10 years, Minnetonka has voted to change zoning in favor of a middle housing project two times. Here's the truth. Cities and elected saying favorable words about affordable housing does not create it. Unless we change the zoning policies preventing it, we ensure the fate of missing middle housing to forever remain missing. Thank you for your consideration. Madam Chair, thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Andrea Real, you're on deck. Uh, Mr. Gottwald, nice to see you. Please introduce yourself for the record and present your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. My name is Steve Gottwald. I represent the Central Minnesota Builders Association. Um, and so I'm here on behalf of our 300 area developers, builders, contractors, and associated service providers in the greater St. Cloud area. We enthusiastically support passage of this bill, and we thank Senator Mitchell for her leadership in bringing it forward. Housing affordability and access are two critical issues facing our area and our entire state. The best way to address these issues is to lift roadblocks to the construction of new housing and eliminate unfunded mandates placed on developers, builders, buyers, and renters. This legislation will empower individuals and help meet the critical need for starter homes and workforce affordable housing by supporting property rights over government mandates. Now, we are more than 100,000 units behind in the state of Minnesota. We need comprehensive zoning reform to turn that around. I served on a city council. I served on a planning commission. I've served here in the state legislature, so I understand the need for local input and for city control and those sorts of things, but we're not getting it done. And it's the old definition of insanity, right? Expecting different results from doing the same thing over and over again. We need to do something different. This bill again lifts the barriers that hamper new housing by banning exclusionary policies and lifting unfunded mandates. CMBA is very proud to support this bill. And again, we thank Senator Mitchell and we thank all of you for your time and attention. We urge you to support Senate file 3964. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, on deck, we will go to a virtual testifier, David Warshe. Uh, Ms. Real, welcome to the uh, committee. Please introduce yourself for the record and present your testimony. Thank you, Chair Port and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Andrea Real, and I'm a volunteer with an organization called Neighbors for More Neighbors. We organize to address our housing shortage, create complete neighborhoods, advance racial equity, and slow climate change. I'm here today to ask you to, to, to uh, support the two bills that you have heard. These bills are important for many reasons, but I want to highlight two of them for you today, racial equity and climate. The current restrictive policies in most Minnesota cities are rooted in the deeply racist history of using rules like exclusionary zoning, setbacks, lot sizes, floor area ratios, parking requirements, and much more to exclude black, brown, and indigenous Minnesotans from finding homes. The maps that were developed in the pre-civil rights era are strikingly similar to the maps being used today. These policies continue to segregate our communities and drive inequity. These bills are an important step to counteract that legacy. Minnesotans care deeply about our natural environment from the Boundary Waters to Mere Island, Big, Mere Big Island and everywhere in between. Uh, the biggest impacts to climate change in Minnesota come from transportation and land use. And this is not just an issue in the cities. Minnesotans of all income levels and job types deserve a safe and abundant housing. Greater Minnesota is not exempt from the housing shortages and today we know that many working class families and individuals are struggling to afford housing from janitors to home health care workers and agricultural workers across the state, struggling to afford a place to rent and put food on the table near their workplaces. With smart land use policy, we can address these issues all over Minnesota. Building homes close to work, school, and stores allow people to shorten commutes and spend more time doing the things that they love. The further we have to travel to live our lives because of past decisions to separate workplaces and places to live directly prevents us from living sustainably. 
thank you for your time and your consideration. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Warshe. Please introduce yourself for the record and present your testimony. And uh, excuse me, on deck will be Shauna Johnson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and others that are here today. Uh, my name is David Worshe. I'm with Worshe Homes in St. Cloud, Minnesota. I am a um, design build company. We also have a real estate company, land development company, and a, another sister company that builds single family rental homes. Uh, the CMBA has submitted some great points in their letter. Um, so in my short time, I want to concentrate on two different areas. Um, obviously, it's housing supply is low and we need more. But affordable housing and uh, the property rights and uh, the city's zoning powers. So affordable housing, uh, workforce housing, why is it important now? I just happened to be visiting last week, I was out in Bozeman, Montana, an area that's absolutely exploding. It's so exciting to be there. There's houses going up, there's apartments going up, there's commercial buildings going up. But what I found is that all the people that were working on those projects that were helping me in the restaurant and the stores couldn't live in the area. The workforce housing was so high to live there that they had to live outside of it or they had to team up and have multiple people living there. They couldn't own and we're definitely renting and rents were high. So the affordable housing side of it, we've been in a great spot for about 20 years. Price of land is going up and the cities are developing land however they want to uh, restrict or create that. The cost of building is going up and there wasn't much we could do there either. But the one benefit we had is we had low interest rates, as low as 3%. And that's what was able to get people to afford homes. The days of 3% are gone. And I don't know if we're going to see those again. So we have to look at the other things that the cities can do and the government, local governments can do to help bring the fees down and change the restrictions on lot sizes where we place houses. Something as, as simple as moving a house 10 feet closer to the street can save thousands of dollars in just the driveway cost. The second part I wanted to talk about was uh, property rights and omitting city zoning powers and roadblocks or creating provisions so we can easily move through them. I believe this is a key element. Uh, personally, in central Minnesota, I have a development that started in 2005. It's the next year after this development was started, an ordinance was put in place that restricted this type of development to be done anymore. Mr. Borchet, if you can please uh, conclude your testimony. I can do that. Back then, the housing industry was going crazy, and now, 15 years later, we want to continue this development, but due to the ordinances, they won't allow it, and an entire comprehensive plan has to be done in order to allow us to continue this type of development. So if we can get through these ordinance changes simple and through a city council vote, that would be the way we can keep these type of developments moving and help the cities with their tax base. I appreciate your time and your support in this bill. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Mr. Paul Egger, you are on deck. Welcome to the committee. Uh, Ms. Johnson, please introduce yourself for the record and present your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Shauna Johnson, and I am the City Administrator for the City of Waite Park. And I want to uh, first take this opportunity to applaud this group for addressing um, the housing needs that we see here in Minnesota. Um, I think it's also an important issue to point out that these are also important issues to all of the cities across the state of Minnesota as well. Um, I have served 25 years in local government, and I've also had the opportunity to be on the League of Minnesota Cities um, president as what I served on, and I also have been a member of the Coalition of Greater Minnesota Cities. So I've had an opportunity to interact with both appointed and elected officials from across the state. And I, I just want to urge everybody that I, I feel a little bit like cities are on the defense here because I think it, it um, certainly makes us feel that we don't find these issues important as well, and that is certainly not the case. One of the biggest questions I feel that we really need to address and make sure that it, it is important is that 
cities are not all the same. There's not a one-size-fits-all approach. And I think some of the biggest fundamental questions that need to be answered with what this is being done um, is how are cities supposed to provide the services that are needed to meet these needs of what's being looked at? Um, in single family residential areas that we have, um, they're sized for the capacity of having single family homes. When we start putting higher density um, demands on those particular areas, the ability for us to be able to provide those basic services that are needed are coming into question. Um, I can tell you within the city of Waite Park, um, those kinds of capacity issues are really at, at what our biggest concerns are and I think needs to really be addressed. We are certainly um, supportive of looking at housing efforts, but when you're going into existing um, areas where those things have already been predetermined and planned, it's very difficult for us to be able to retrofit those services. I think the other thing that I wanna just mention is, is that for the city of Waite Park, We've just completed two years of working on our strategic plan and our comprehensive plan that we involved many multiple different individuals within our own communities. Housing is one of those big concerns and we're working within our communities to be able to provide those services. So I just urge this group to, to look at that, that the cities here also have to have a voice in what's being considered and that we too understand the importance of housing. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Next on is Kormasa Duard. Mr. Egger, welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record and present your testimony. Um, Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Paul Egger and I'm Senior Vice President of Governmental Affairs for the Minnesota Realtors Association. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today in support of Senator Mitchell's Senate File 3964. And Madam Chair, thank you for the conversation that this committee uh, started on Tuesday and the work that Senators Dreheim and Lucero uh, brought forward to the committee, uh, which all contribute to um, trying to create more home ownership opportunities and greater housing affordability. The data is clear. We have a housing supply problem, which has led to rising home prices. The bill here today, along with the bills you heard on Tuesday, attempts to respond to this challenge by allowing the market to better respond to consumer demand for more housing and more types of housing. I encourage you to read an August 7, 2021 Star Tribune article titled, How Twin Cities Housing Rules Keep the Metro Segregated. Among the considerable amount of data in that article are the following. Quote, at least 73% of residential land in the Twin Cities is governed by local zoning ordinances that only allow single family detached homes. And also, quote, more than 65% of land where only single family homes can be built requires a minimum lot size of one quarter acre or more, at least twice the size of a typical one in Minneapolis or St. Paul. And finally, quote, about 10% of residential land in the Twin Cities allows for more modest cost housing, such as duplexes, triplexes, and townhomes or mobile homes. This is often referred to as the missing middle. The Minneapolis Federal Reserve has also done a lot of great work on housing. And in an article that they had uh, released this summer, I just wanna read a couple uh, pieces from that article. Quote, better housing policies could unleash the private market to build more housing at all price levels, and quote, a housing agenda bigger than subsidy alone looks like addressing an overly restrictive land use policies, time consuming development processes, and onerous regulations that can derail sound housing projects before they get underway. Uh, this bill is starting a great discussion here today, and we hope that as the package moves forward that all the stakeholders, including those who have opposition to many of these ideas, will bring forward helpful solutions to improve the packages moves forward. And we look forward to working with you, Madam Chair, on this project. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. On deck is Bradley Peterson. Welcome to the committee, uh, Ms. Kormasha. Please introduce yourself for the record and present your testimony. Chair, member of the committee, my name is Kamasa DeWard. I'm with SCIU. We are a union for healthcare workers. I personally have worked in, in nursing homes and has a PCA. On behalf of my union, we support Senate File 3968 and 3980. I know firsthand how hard it is to find affordable housing. We need to build more, more, above, oh, we need to build more, and supplies of supply of housing. This bill will help us build more homes for workers. A few years ago, I went through a crisis. I lived in Oakdale in a two-bedroom apartment. I paid 1,050 a month for rent. It was, extremely, it was extremely crowded for me and my five children. 
but we could afford it. I lost my main PCA job, my main PCA clients, and the COVID housing assistance program expired. I also lost my place in Oakdale. We could not afford a place under, we could not afford a place, and everywhere we looked, it was 1,500 a month. The next few years, I spent living in my, living in my vehicle with my five children, we were parked in fear. We were parked in various locations to get. We were parked in various locations and try to go to work in school. To try to go to work in school. Sometimes we didn't have enough money to afford a hotel. But even then, we would sneak in. We would sneak in to hotels because my family was too big and we couldn't, af we couldn't afford a, a one, one room. We have to decide if I should, if, to feed my children or spend money fixing my Jeep. Eventually, I got some, some extra income from my family. And we finally got a place after two years. This bill will help, will help. This bill would make it legal to build more housing in Oakdale. Only a tiny friction of land is available for duplexes and other multifamily housing. I understand a lot of people would like a big house in the big yard. That is my dream too. But that should not be the only kind of housing when you are struggling. You would want a roof and some walls. You would want to play a safe place. And, and stability. More housing options will be will help people like me, and it would it wouldn't hurt anyone. This bill will help workers. My union supports similar reform. Minneapolis and St. Paul more housing. In Minneapolis, lower rents throughout the metro area. This is a huge pay increase for our members. This bill will put more money in our pockets of workers. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, Mr. Peterson. And Daniel Lightfoot, you are up next. Mr. Peterson, if you want to introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair. Again, Bradley Peterson with the Coalition of Greater Minnesota Cities. Uh, so again, uh, I don't think there is any debate about the need to build more housing. Um, we believe that the goals of this bill, both in the housing building and on the environmental concerns that were noted, are certainly laudable and need attention. Uh, but the approach here is one that unfortunately we are strongly opposed to. Like the previous bill, Senate File 3964 displaces local decision making and disregards complex questions of infrastructure and long range city planning. As noted previously, our cities are doing everything in their power to address the housing challenges in their communities. Just in the last year, I or my staff have had the opportunity to visit housing projects across the state. In Laverne alone, I got to see a new development of duplexes uh, on already developed part of the city. I got to see a new multifamily apartment building that had recently been built, as well as the development of single family and duplexes that are in the process of being built on the edge of town. In another one of our cities, we got to see a brand new apartment complex this fall, uh, sitting on the edge of their downtown and on the site of a former service station. In Hutchinson, much of the city is already zoned for more than a single family. Nonetheless, they're very concerned about the implications of this bill on parking, stormwater, and other infrastructure. The overall point of these is that these things are happening in our cities already, but they're happening through thoughtful planning and while balancing the infrastructure, service delivery, and quality of life considerations in their entire community. And that's the role of local government. 
to sit at the intersection of all these varying community concerns and arrive at local solutions that fit local circumstances, infrastructure, and financial realities. Finally, the legislation has a significant and gaping hole in that it does not address residential development in townships outside of cities. If you are concerned about large lot development, sprawl, and the inefficient use of infrastructure dollars, that is an item that needs to be addressed. In conclusion, uh, we don't necessarily see that this bill is necessary or even helpful in addressing the housing concerns in greater Minnesota. Availability of contractors and workforce, infrastructure costs, inflation, interest rates, and financing challenges are all much more pressing issues. We want to be part of the solution, and we look forward to uh, the rest of this week and next week's discussions to do so. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, on deck is Jason Waddell. Mr. Lightfoot, welcome to the committee again. Please introduce yourself for the record and present your testimony. Well, thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Uh, good afternoon once again. Daniel Lightfoot with the League of Minnesota Cities. Um, we certainly appreciate the conversations, uh, again, that we've had with you, Madam Chair, members of this committee, and, and Senator Mitchell as well on this bill. Um, and we hope to continue those conversations uh, to attempt to address our concerns. Uh, we, unfortunately, are, are in opposition to this bill. Um, provisions in Senate File 3964 broadly preempt city zoning and land use authorities completely removes public input in the residential development process and also lacks consideration for how cities utilize zoning and land use to ensure public health, safety and welfare and finance and scale public infrastructure to support new housing density. Uh, beyond the basic premise of stripping local control from decisions around residential development, in individual communities, uh, there are things beyond local control that remain functionally wrong with this bill and pose questions about how certain provisions contradict and how cities could continue to ensure the public safety and welfare of those residents. And those are all outlined in a joint city letter uh, in your packets. Um, we remain extremely concerned that the bill creates an overly broad and rigid framework for something as hyper-local as zoning and land use while maintaining, while mandating density regardless of infrastructure capacity with no mechanism to pay for a city to reasonably plan for increasing infrastructure capacity to support that level of density. It prohibits public hearings on most development projects, uh, even for residents who may have, uh, may be directly impacted by new development and have material impacts on their property. Uh, among other strict limitations and prohibitions, including unreasonably small minimum lot sizes for higher density and overly broad aesthetic design standard prohibitions that would absolutely invite litigation given how they are drafted while prohibiting any ability for a city to impose uh, minimum standards. Um, we certainly look forward to continuing work uh, with uh, Senator Mitchell and, uh, and members of this committee to address these concerns. Um, and with me, I have uh, Jason Waddell and Evan Vogel here to provide additional city perspective. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, Mr. Vogel, you are on deck. Mr. Waddell, welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record and present your testimony. Thank you, Chair Port and members of the committee. My name is Jason Waddell, and I'm the city manager of Prior Lake, and I'm also here on behalf of the League of Minnesota Cities and the 19 city members of the Municipal Legislative Commission, where, according to Housing First, we represent 80% of the top five housing permit cities. Uh, we need to respectfully oppose this bill. As cities, we are statutorily required to create comprehensive system, system plans. These plans include modeling our sanitary sewer, water mains, water treatment plants, parks, streets, to ensure capacity is available to accommodate our future growth. Those models are predicated on a planned density of housing that is mandated by the Met Council. In addition, this process also requires a public hearing on the proposed plans to provide an opportunity for our citizens to have their voices heard. This bill both eliminates public comments and tosses out the decades of work that went into our comp plans. To achieve the densities permitted by right in this bill, Cities will need to spend hundreds of millions of dollars tearing up our streets um, and replacing prematurely our utilities, drilling more wells, and expanding our water treatment plants. When I try to describe our city's infrastructure to my family and friends, I often use the analogy of our body's circulatory system. We all have veins and arteries that transport blood throughout our body. Those veins and arteries are largest in our torso, and they get smaller and smaller as they go into our arms and legs and eventually out to our fingers and toes. This bill is asking the city to attach an arm to the end of my pinky and expecting there to be sufficient blood flow to support it. 
We've been planning for many decades in Prior Lake uh, to a, a, um, annex a 2,000 acre portion of the township next to us. Based on our current comp plan, this area will add 6,000 new homes. Under this bill, this area could have a density as high as 36,000 homes. We have made a $7 million investment in sewer pipes, water mains, wells, water ma treatment plants, specifically engineered to serve this area. Under this bill, the infrastructure we have built could never meet the demand. As such, the city council will be forced to cut their losses and the 50-year agreement we have with the township. We have heard about the shortage of housing. If this bill advances, it will effectively eliminate 6,000 new housing units in the Twin Cities. Uh, if the goals increase density, we would ask that you work with cities so we can planfully um, locate and strategically plan for where density should be added. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, on deck is Sue Budd. Uh, Mr. Vogel, welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record and present your testimony. Thank you, Chair Port. Good afternoon, Chair Port and committee members. My name is Evan Vogel. I'm the city administrator for the city of Cambridge, a board member for the League of Minnesota Cities Board of Directors, and I'm also representing the Coalition of Greater Minnesota Cities. Access to affordable housing and home ownership are significant components of the American dream. To this end, the missing middle housing bill is well-intentioned, but it likely would not accomplish its goals of enhanced housing affordability as it's drafted today. The bill resorts to unprecedented zoning preemption rather than seeking to provide incentives, blanket mandates instead of respecting local solutions. It will force communities into an overly rigid framework and remove the ability of community members to appeal to their locally elected leaders to voice concerns that help shape their communities. Today I'd like to focus on concerns with Section 2, which requires that cities would allow increased density by right forcing cities like Cambridge to accommodate between two and eight units per lot while limiting parking minimums to one per residential unit, setting minimum lot requirements at 4,000 square feet and limiting square footage requirements for dwellings regardless of the number of units. It places these requirements without conditions on the developer that could reduce sale price of the house or place limitations on rent that residents would be asked to pay. In Cambridge, we have shown how local solutions can work. We have 3,059 residential units in the city. In just the last five years, the city has worked with developers to build starter homes on smaller lots and provided tax increment financing for the creation of 525 apartment units that range from deeply affordable to workforce housing. Additionally, along with our developer partners, the city has added or is in the process of adding hundreds of single family homes on lots smaller than those traditionally allowed under zoning code. There are better ways to improve housing access and affordability in partnership with cities rather than in opposition or to the detriment of cities' traditionally local control. Development must reflect the needs and wants of a community rather than be driven by state mandates. The project I mentioned above made sense at the time they were implemented, in part because they responded to local concerns with the input of, of local citizens and generating local support. The city's actions today should not prescribe the action the city must take in the future, particularly without local buy-in. I'm asking that all members oppose Senate File 3964 and oppose any further effort to preempt municipal zoning authority. Thank you for this opportunity to testify today. Uh, thank you for your testimony. On deck is Martha, uh, I apologize if I mess this up, Angelomole. Uh, Ms. Budd, welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record and present your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Sue Budd, and I serve as a city council member for the city of St. Louis Park. I'm excited to be here today to ask for your support for the missing middle housing bill. I was elected just over two years ago and ran on a platform of affordable housing, our climate action plan, and racial equity. The bill before you impacts all three of these areas. I have a grown foster son with disability. He holds a full-time job that pays just more than minimum wage, but not a living wage. Because of the current housing crisis and limited housing supply, he sat on wait lists for an apartment for several years. He was excited that there was a proposed project right in our neighborhood that he would qualify for, but many years passed before it finally broke ground this past fall. While many neighbors supported the project, there was a group working to make the project fail and this made the structure half the original size and delayed progress for a significant time. As you may know, uh, St. Louis Park sits along the future light rail green line. 
As a city council member, I have spent a great deal of time reviewing housing development proposals for our three new stops. I vote on these projects and see how the current process slows the development down. I don't like being a gatekeeper on housing development, and I believe this bill addresses failure in our current system. Fast forward, and I'm happy to say that my son has finally, was finally able to move out of my sister's basement into a studio apartment within walking distance to his job, no longer requiring him to commute several miles each day. At 36 years old, he's finally able to have the independence he has waited so long to realize. Some may tell us to be afraid of what this bill will do, but this is truly about opening up all of our communities to anyone who would call them home, regardless of how much money they make, their race, or their zip code. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record and present your testimony. Uh, and after this testimony, we only have one more virtual testifier. All right, um, good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. So my name is Martha Njolomoli. I am an economist at Center of the American Experiment. I am here today to testify in support of Senate File 3964 because I believe it would help address the housing affordability crisis in Minnesota, especially in the Twin Cities. As a public policy organization, Center of the American Experiment has one mission. That mission is to identify and advocate for policies that make Minnesota freer, more prosperous, and better governed state. To that mission, my colleagues and I undertake research on several wide-ranging issues all affecting the lives of every Minnesotan, including housing. Overall, our research over the years has shown that Minnesotans, especially those living in the Twin Cities, are short-changed when it comes to housing. In a report we published in 2020, American Experiment found that after removing coastal areas, the Twin Cities had the sixth largest, highest housing cost among the 100 largest metro areas, despite only being the 16th largest. When looking only at the Midwest, the Twin Cities did not only just have the most expensive housing, but costs were also 37% higher than Chicago, which is the next most expensive metro area, and more than double that of both Indianapolis and Cleveland. Overall, housing costs in the Twin Cities area were 56% higher than the other largest metro areas in the Midwest. There's only one factor to blame for this. We have excessive regulations in Minnesota. Stringent building codes and regulations such as minimum lot sizes, safety codes, energy saving codes, and zoning rules make it more costly and time consuming to develop housing here. This leads to high housing prices as supply fails to keep up with demand. The fact of the matter is that we need more housing. And currently, uh, local rules makes that impossible. I believe that a lot of aspects of SF3964 does do a good job of addressing all of the factors that makes it nearly impossible to build housing in Minnesota, such as zoning restrictions on middle housing and accessory drain units, density restrictions, minimum parking requirements, minimum load sizes. For that reason, I urge everybody in this committee to support this bill. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Thank you for your testimony. Our final testifier is Gabe Kravitz online. Uh, please introduce yourself for the record again and present your testimony. Well, thank you, Chair Port and members of the committee for uh, the opportunity to testify again. I'm Gabe Kravitz from the Housing Policy Initiative at the Peace Trusts, a nonpartisan nonprofit organization. I also grew up in Minnesota. Um, the provisions in SF3964 are similar to measures taken in other jurisdictions that have proven successful in increasing housing supply and lowering costs. The evidence for the effectiveness of these policies is strong. Accessory dwelling units rent for less than either single family houses or apartments in new buildings and are often affordable to those earning 80% or less of the area median without government subsidies. Reducing minimum lot sizes in Houston has enabled the construction of 80,000 new townhouses with prices typically affordable to those earning around the area median. Eliminating parking requirements uh, are, and allowing more apartments uh, on commercial zones helped keep rents nearly flat in Minneapolis over the last seven years, even as rents rose 20% in Minnesota overall. And middle housing consistently has lower rents than single family houses or high rise buildings. Uh, and a, two, a 2023 Pew survey shows a majority of Americans support a wide range of land use reforms to build more housing, including 86% supporting simplifying permitting. Thanks for the opportunity to share data from Pew. Thank you very much for your testimony. Uh, members, that concludes our testimony for today. Um, we'll move on to discussion, amendments, and questions. Um, 
I'm just going to start. Uh, Senator Mitchell, thank you very much for bringing this bill. Um, when I first joined the legislature uh, after the 2020 election, it was the first time I really saw a comprehensive bill about zoning reform. And Senator Dreheim, it was your bill at the time. Um, I will admit, at that point, I was not convinced that this was the path to create the specifically affordable housing um, that I knew our communities needed. Um, I thought this needs to be coupled with real investments and money. <laughs> um, real investments and money. And that year, uh, though we had really a committed bipartisan committee that was very focused on the need for housing, our budget target was $10 million. And I think at the end of negotiations, we got it up to 50 million. That nowhere meets the needs of our state. Um, last year, we were able to move that to over a billion dollars, which is an incredible investment for Minnesota, almost two thirds of which is for development, which is incredible if we can get the development and if we can get it to be the kind of housing that Minnesotans need, um, where they need it and when they need it, which is now. Um, I. I don't think this bill is a silver bullet, just like I don't think the bill that we passed last year is a silver bullet, but they are all tools um, to help us move towards a state that really values and invests in the kind of housing that its communities need. And I really appreciate the amount of work that you've done on this bill. I know that the authors of these bills, Senator Pa, Senator Bolden, Senator Mitchell, the ones we heard yesterday, Senator Lucero and Dreheim, have all worked on these bills for months, if not years, um, and have taken many, many, many meetings over many, many, many hours, um, asking for all stakeholders to be partners in this work. And I really appreciate the way that you've gone about that. Um, I, am, I think like these bills are a great place to start thinking about another tool that we can use. Because frankly, the status quo of the way that we do zoning and land use right now is simply not working. We are 100,000 housing units short. And that should be a staggering number to all of us. Um, so Senator Mitchell, I just, I really appreciate the time and the energy and the clarity of conviction that you have brought to this conversation and also your willingness to just continue meeting with people and working and bringing great ideas to make the bill better. Um, we are, that's exactly what this committee looks for. We value it really highly, so I appreciate that. Uh, Senator Lucero. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And I, well, I'm gonna offer the A1 amendment. Senator Lucero offers the A1 amendment. Senator and, Lucero, do you want to describe the amendment? I will, and before I get to that or while it's being passed out, I just wanted to, to echo your comments, and I appreciate that because uh, having the multiple voices and, and we are touching so many different topics, there are so many different voices with all very legitimate perspectives, and I have valued and enjoyed all these conversations, and I look forward to the continued conversations because housing is so important and we, and as you also said, Madam Chair, there is no silver bullet. But these conversations and these different proposals being put on the table so that all can evaluate and we try to formulate something uh, are definitely important. And I appreciate uh, this bill uh, as well, uh, Senator Mitchell. So thank you for that. So the A1 amendment deals with homeowners associations. And so one of the things that I wanna make sure is that municipalities don't condition approval of developments on developers forming homeowners associations or have a condition that an individual property become a member of a homeowners association. So what this seeks to do is to, again, put that prohibition in place. Thank you, Senator Lucero. Senator Madam Chair, if I could also add before that, uh, I, I've also heard that there might be some, uh, a few testifiers that wanted to comment on this. If, the, if that is the case, if that's accurate, if they wanted to come up, I would also invite as well. Um, I think for the sake of time, we'll try to keep it to committee discussion at this moment, though we do welcome written testimony on all of this uh, as well, but we do only have 15 minutes of committee time left. Senator Mitchell. Uh, thank you, 
Chair Port, um, thank you, Senator Lucero, for offering this, and also uh, to Senator Dreheim for all the work that we did collaboratively, making sure this really suited all the different needs. Um, this was one that I was given in advance, and I always appreciate that because I don't always get that in other committees. And I think this closes a, a really uh, significant potential loophole. So, um, and I told Senator Lu Lucero that uh, as long as the gold jacket wasn't being worn at the time, I could probably take it. No, I'm just kidding. Um, no, I. Uh, so I greatly appreciate this, and I am in full support. Thank you, Senator Mitchell. Uh, Senator Lucero moves the A2, no, the A1 amendment. Uh, any other discussion? All in favor of the amendment say aye. 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 Opposed? The amendment is adopted. <laughs> Senator Dreheim. Thank you, Chair. Um, and thank you for bringing this bill forward. I, I know you've worked hard on it. Um, I would like to offer the A2 amendment. Senator Dreheim offers the A2 amendment. Senator Dreheim to that amendment. Thank you. Um, you know, I, I think you've done a great job with this bill, but like all bills, I think there's some tweaking and, and some topics that we need to, to work through. Um, I, I do know that this will be part of a larger bill that will be tweaked by the chair. Um, but a, a couple things, and you know, I, I've been kind of a broken record um, on home ownership and how I think in Minnesota we do a lot of great things with housing. Uh, obviously, we're in need of more housing, but I think the end goal should be that home ownership piece. When you create more home ownership, you, you bring people that are renting into that. Um, first home, which is very exciting. Um, and I know for a lot of people, including myself, my first home, I had to have renters to pay the mortgage. So I had two renters to help pay the mortgage until my wife moved in. Um, so it's hard to get started. And, you know, I, I don't know if most people know this. I pretty much sold everything I owned to buy my first house. And um, it's a big step. But what can we do as legislators to help in that? So part of this amendment um, puts, changes the definition from affordable housing to affordable owner-occupied housing. Because I think that should be our goal. Uh, to encourage as much as possible to have owner-occupied housing. Um, and I think neighbors would be more comfortable knowing that if Senator Lucero was going to put a house up next to theirs and he was going to live there, I think that should be a higher priority. Um, but food for thought for you, Chair. Um, the, the other thing this does, it deletes um, subdivision 11 and uh, section 1. Um, and that has to do with the uh, demolishing of a, of a house or, or structure. Um, you know, I, I don't know if we should restrict a developer or a city on what to do. I think the free market could decide on what's best for that situation. Um, and I don't think there is um, always a 100% case where we could meet what's drafted in, in the bill. Um, so th those are the two main things in here. I, I know we're short on time. So I, I just wanted to open it up for questions if anybody else in, on the committee has questions, or the author. Senator Mitchell. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Senator Dreheim. Um, because I haven't had this one in advance and I haven't had time to look at it, my initial first blush is that a, I want people to own their homes. We heard a very um, 
you know, personal speech about why people should own their homes. But again, as I said, we I had seniors lose their homes last year from affordable housing that was rented and not everyone wants to own for various reasons. So because of that, uh, the reason that I haven't had time to look at all the implications and this is new to me and that, that piece is my first blush, um, I would request that we not pass this at this time with my commitment that, that we can absolutely talk about this and continue to work on it. And, and I think you know that I will honor that promise. Members, other thoughts, questions uh, about the amendment? Senator Drahan? Yeah, with, with that, um, and I know you're working on your package, um, and I can do the math, um, I, I will withdraw the E2 amendment and hope to work with you, Chair, and Senator Mitchell on uh, the path forward. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Dreheim. I uh, will definitely make sure that, that we have that discussion. Uh, Senator Mohammed. Thank you, Madam Chair. I have few questions, and only because this is the first time we're seeing this bill, because it came from state and local gov. Um, line 3.16, so 316, you define, uh, you define townhouses as a means of a single family residential dwelling unit. Uh, so a unit, two units that's attached, is that considered a town hall? Senator Mitchell. Um, I want to verify with all the definitions. I mean, it should be. Uh, we might have Mr. Erickson, do you yes, want to? Thank you, uh, Chair Port, Senator. Yes, so that's a uh, common thing with housing. There's a lot of questions about what these different housing types are. A townhouse is a single family attached home, but it's on an individually platted lot where it uh, has individual utility service. Now, if it were something like a quadplex or triplex, that would have a similar look and design, but it would be on one lot, generally with one uh, main utility service for the building. Same thing with townhomes, and, or sorry, twin homes and duplexes. A twin home is a uh, two units attached on two individually platted lots, so they're technically two separate properties which share a common wall, where you have a twin home, uh, or sorry, a duplex would be two units on, on one lot. So, you know, there is a more of a land use designation, uh, not necessarily construction code designation to what these are different. And this pr provides that needed clarity uh, in statutes as our uh, land use codes and our building codes rarely if ever, ever keep up with one another. Okay. That's, Senator Mohammed, That's helpful because on the definition here, it says um, townhouse means single family residential dwelling unit constructed in a group of three or more. It doesn't say two yeah. or more. Mr. Erickson. Uh, yes, that would be correct. So what we had a couple of years ago, we had a, a building code definition change in the state of Minnesota. It was 2017. It uh, erased some confusion around whether or not a twin home was a duplex. Uh, so this legislation does reflect a change in 2017 in our state statutes uh, specific to the building codes. And again, this, this language is trying to marry two completely different concepts of building codes and land use. Okay. That's Senator Mohammed. Sorry, Madam Chair. I'll go through the chair. Okay, that's helpful because I thought townhomes were two units attached, ex not three. So I guess building code change in the state. So now it's three? Yeah. Okay, that's helpful. Um, I have another question. So on, on that same page, subdivision four, uh, subdivision three, cities of the first class require residential densities. A city of the first class must permit the development of at least four residential dwelling units. So like Minneapolis is a city of the first class. Are we not legally allowed to do this currently? Mr. Erickson? Yeah. Um, thank you. Chair Port Center, yes, it is not a... Uh, what we call it by right. Uh, they're able to do it more on the variance, the, the 2040 plan lawsuit, you know, that has really changed the discussion of what is currently allowed in Minneapolis relatively recently. Uh, but this would allow it as a by right uh, condition, which you could do up to four units um, without needing a variance or a conditional use permit provided you conform with the rest of the, the local zoning controls in any of the cities of the first class. Senator Mohammed. Okay, so if 2040 plan wasn't overturned and it currently was still, you know, in law in the city, 
would they be allowed to do this without this bill passing? Mr. Erickson. Yes, Chair Portsetter, I'm not as familiar with the specifics of Minneapolis. I believe they did at least have triplexes, so very similar. Uh, I'm not, I just don't have that, uh, without having my computer handy uh, off the top of my head, my apologies. Senator Mohammed. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I guess, I guess I don't understand exactly what this gets at, and maybe this shows my lack of understanding in terms of zoning. So are we saying that when there is a, in an areas of transit, we will only be building multifamily homes? Senator Mitchell. Or are we saying, like, this is, we can, currently, what can we do under law? Senator Mitchell. So, um... This is this is very permissive to the the people that might be building if it's their land or the builders what they're putting in their plan um, There is no requirement There are incentives if there's affordable housing or if there's environmental housing or even just to to do this at all if a developer gets the land and still decides that their customers are going to be single-family homes and they don't do this there is no requirement to do this. This just gives us more flexibility that if there is a market for these things, these things don't have to necessarily go through the city zoning, which might be excluding them. Senator Mohammed. So this then, uh, you'd say this triumph, this is, this goes over, I guess it makes sense because it's state law, so ignore that question. Okay, I have a few more questions, I'm sorry. Um, thank you. Thank you. In subdivision 13, which is something we talked about under Senator Paz's bill, because it's also in that bill, um, Senator Mitchell, ad, uh, administrative design, so like cities right now, your bill says the administrative review process must review or approve or deny such building permit. The, would this have to go, sorry, would this have to go through a public process under the city? Do individual developments, will they have to go through public hearings through their cities? Senator Mitchell. So, um, there is not one required just to add this in. Again, this is a, kind of a, a flexibility thing. Um, there is also a process where if a city already has a plan that might fit this, that they could put it into a review so that the state could look at it and say, you know, this meets the intention of our plan. Senator Mohammed. Um, Thank you, Madam Chair. So I guess, sorry, I guess I couldn't find it earlier, now I did. It says the administrative review process shall not involve a public hearing unless one is required by state or federal law, which is I think what, we get, what Senator Powell was getting at earlier, where she said under zoning, they would have to go through a public hearing, but from an individual to individual development, they don't have to go through a public hearing. Is that, what, does that apply here? Senator Mitchell. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. So typically when a new housing development is going to be created in a city, there, there is a process for, for people to say, well, I really love that farmland or that farmland should be, a, should be new development. So we're not taking away that part of the process. Um, so I guess, I guess we just wanna clarify that you know, the, the types of hearings that you might have already had can still be had, but it is, what is not going to be debatable is whether or not the things that will now be state law um, can be built into some of those housing developments. And, and there are portions of this that just kind of get us into um, compliance, so to speak, with the state law. So one of the things that was raised was um, well, there's, what if there isn't the infrastructure to, to add in, you know, multi-use homes? Well, there is a section that attaches back to our other state laws that say, you know, those requirements are still in effect. We are still going to make sure that these new developments, when we do this, have proper 
uh, water hookups and utility hookups and, and those infrastructure things. So, so some of what you see here is just us attaching back to clarifying how this fits in the framework of the things that we already do under state law and some of the, the authority that cities already have under state law. If that clarifies it. Madam Chair, with Senator permission, I, I could maybe add just a little bit. Senator Lucero. So just very, I'll try to, it it's, can be a longer conversation, but uh, trying to be very succinct. If something is changing, such as the zoning type, the land use type, uh, or if the, the developer is looking for some kind of exceptions to what might be in code, that's what kicks off, generally speaking, there might be nuances, but generally speaking, that's what would kick off a public hearing of which the public could come in and offer uh, thoughts on if, that, if the city council should permit that change. But in this use case where if a developer comes, if a piece of property is already zoned for whatever, commercial, industrial, residential, and the developer comes in and isn't asking for anything to change. They just want to build whatever and it meets the, the existing uh, uh, ordinances. There is no public hearing and no, no opportunity for public input. So it would just move forward. If that, I'm, I'm trying to just give the brief example of when a public hearing would be uh, uh, permitted and then when a public hearing would not be permitted or wouldn't be required. Senator Mohammed. So then who takes the fault when something doesn't go right? The city? Senator Lucero? Uh, I would need more clarity, but it would Sorry. depends on what depends on what the fault is if it's if it's like a crumbling foundation or Yeah, I guess I guess I could clarify a little bit more. I guess I'm really stuck on the 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 bill that Senator Paul has because this one has some parts of it around public hearing, which we said development to development, they will not this bill would not allow public hearing, and the city has to permit in the other bill within 60 days, and if they don't do it, then they get the permit automatically, and then Senator Pa said, and if things don't go right, then it falls back on the city. If that makes sense. That's, I think, what I'm still stuck on, and I think parts of this bill has that. So, Senator Mohammed, if I can, and happy to continue this discussion, we do have to give up this room in a few minutes, but we'll continue um, with these bills and with this discussion um, on Tuesday. Um, but to that point, I think uh, this language is to sort of put it in context of how things that are currently allowed in our cities now how the process works. If something is zoned for a single family home and you come in to build a single family home, you don't, there's no public hearing for that. You're already checking off the list of all the things that the city requires for that lot. And if we are requiring by right that in that same single family home lot, you can build up to a triplex or a quadplex depending on the things, and you check off all of those same requirements um, that you would need to do it, then you get to do it. And so why would we require cities to hold a public hearing for something that they are required to allow to happen in that place is sort of the conversation. Senator Mohammed? That's helpful, but that's not clear in the bill. So I'd love to continue talking to you about Great. that as we move forward. We'd love to work with you on that language. I think we have a couple of other language clarifications mm -hmm. that we'll continue to work on. Um, Senator Lucero. Thank you, and very briefly, uh, I won't go into all the reasons why, but uh, with any bill, obviously there's gonna be some things that you can support and can't support. One of the things, I just wanna put it out there as your craftiness, that creates the, the largest heartburn for me, anyway, in the existing language, is the minimum lot size. Uh, the minimum lot size of 4,000 square feet for cities that are, I think, it's second, third, and fourth class. That's my, my greatest heartburn. There's not time to go into the reasons for that, but I just want to throw that out there. I appreciate that, Senator Lucero, and you've raised that to me before. Um, I think we can discuss potential amendment language as well. Um, members, we do have to leave the room. Uh, testifiers, thank you so much for your deep engagement today. I really appreciate that. Um, Members, please discuss with Senator Mitchell, Senator Pa, and Senator Bolden any amendments to their bills or any changes you'd like to see as we move forward and craft this. And with that, the, or we're laying the bill over. Senator Mitchell. Oh.
Does, this doesn't have to go anywhere? I'm sorry. Nope, we're laying it over for now and okay. we'll pull it together into a package for next week. Okay, my apologies. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Senator Mitchell. With no other uh, bills before us, we are adjourned. You're the only person ever to catch the French.